Our guest today is Jean-Claude Basque. He's the program manager for La Front Commune de la Justice Sociale, or the social Common Front for Social Justice. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. It's an election year. Um, there'll be lots to talk about. Your organization has done work for many years trying to get on the larger narrative, the issue of poverty, poverty mm -hmm. reduction, which in turn would tie to a better economy. Where would you like to start with that big topic? Oh, yes. Uh, probably just kind of a, an overview of what's the situation in New Brunswick. Uh, it's clear that about one in seven uh, citizens is uh, living in poverty. So there's about 100,000 uh, citizens, like men, women and children that are living in poverty. On one side, uh, we have also 105,000 workers that are making $15 and less. Uh, so that's kind of on one side. The other side, we have um, uh, since 2010 a poverty reduction plan, like a government plan that's managed by a Crown Corporation. And um, the goal of this plan is to reduce poverty. Uh, generally, like by they, they say twenty five percent and then uh, fifty percent for deep poverty. So uh, the plan has been in place for the last eight year, and we have seen some progress, but uh, there's still a lot of people that are uh, living in poverty. Hmm. Do you think we're going at it the right way? I can remember Senator Ermine Cohen out of St. John back in the 80s doing a study on childhood poverty. It's somewhere here in, in yeah. my library. <clears throat> Nothing much seems to have changed. So maybe a root question is, how do we get at this issue called poverty? And is it a matter of econ economics or is it a matter of heart? I think it's both. Uh, certainly it's a question of economic. Like people don't have enough revenue. Uh, those that are at low mm -hmm. wages, like $15 and less. And like I mentioned, there's quite a number of workers in New Brunswick. Mm. Uh, and also the whole issue of people that are on social assistance, that are like the poorest of the poor, and that have like the single employable or just have a revenue, a net revenue above $7,000 a year. So yes, it's a question of revenue. It's a question of heart in a sense that um, we don't consider the issue of poverty as a big issue as a society. Uh, because I think for a number of reasons, and one of the big reasons is the prejudice that most of us have regarding people uh, living in poverty. Uh, the fact also that a lot of people that are living in poverty don't vote. Uh, they don't have a political voice. They don't have organization. Yes, we like the Common Front is one of their organization, but it's limited what it can do. Hmm. So it, this, most of the organization in New Brunswick that deals with poverty are service organization. They're not lobbying organization. They 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 don't. They're not kind of a voice for the voiceless, let's see. So that has a real uh, impact when it comes to a policy, what kind of policy different government, be it like liberal or conservative through the year, what kind of policy do they put in place mm. for helping uh, people that are living in poverty. So uh, I think the, this the two sides, the economy, the revenue side, the hard side in a sense of not taking it as a real uh, profound issue. Hmm. Because we saw like at the federal level also a number of years ago, they wanted to uh, get rid of child poverty and it didn't happen. Like in New Brunswick, there's still quite a number of children that are living in poverty. So many avenues to explore right off of that. <clears throat> One of them would be, does capitalism need poverty in order to be <laughs> functional? Yeah. Probably. Uh, capitalism needs like low wages for part of the, its economy to uh, function. Uh, 
uh, and if you have part of your economy that's based on low wage it means you're going to have people that are left out uh, be it there, and workers like not people that are on social assistance so yeah in as in that sense it's kind of ingrained in our economic system hmm. and uh, people that are considered not uh, productive because of health issue be it mental physical issue uh, that are have problem with addiction uh, different kind of social social problem they're not productive so capitalism in that sense say okay we're going to kind of keep you alive but uh, barely yeah. and uh, because you're you're not kind of giving back to society you're not uh, producing wealth so in that sense that mentality is certainly a part of the problem in New Brunswick or in Canada mm -hmm. Um, as you say that, I think of the NAFTA negotiations mm. going on right now, some of the American politics going on right now, mm. <clears throat> and the movement of jobs to where there's the cheapest labor. Yeah. Um, New Brunswick, being only a certain size, has no ability to insulate itself from that. So do you see part of the path to the future is a, a I want to call it a different economy, but that sometimes scares people. Yeah. But the shifts in the economy, the shifts in the directions we need to go so that we can be more self-sufficient um, and that people can actually get a job that pays for their basic needs instead of three jobs to try to patch together mm -hmm. their basic needs. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you're right, New Brunswick, uh, we forget we're one of the small provinces, like you mm. know, in Canada. Mm. So our economy is limited. Uh, part of the economy also is exporting to the United States. Uh, we haven't developed a, a self-sufficient economy. And to what extent is possible in the 21st century is up for discussion, I think. But we certainly could do a lot better than what we're doing uh, regarding certain part of the economy, be it agriculture, uh, social programs. But it's, it's there's a, I think there's a concrete limit to what a, a small government can do. Uh, to change the situation and it's how do we work in these limit and also where do we put our priorities as a government or as a society mm. and uh, and that debate hasn't happened in New Brunswick uh, we were always kind of patching or trying putting some patch on uh, some of the social issues that are coming up, hmm. uh, be it um, uh, young kids uh, uh, with difficulty in school, be it a uh, child care situation. So we're always, uh, or the, the housing situation. So we're, we're trying like not to see the kind of the whole picture. And that's, but that stopped like having a kind of a, what we could call, I guess, a holistic approach to mm -hmm. reducing poverty mm -hmm. and reducing also the situation of uh, low-income workers mm -hmm. uh, because uh, quite a number of them are living lives that are really difficult and uh, uh, economically but also socially and ha that has an impact on their children. So, yeah, they, they, but this discussion is not happening, uh, be it from the community organization that are working on issue of poverty, be it at the, at the um, uh, government level, or be it even at the um, uh, private sector level. Uh, nobody has stopped and said, okay, where do we want to go? We, in a sense, we tried it. I think for with the first poverty reduction plan, uh, there was kind of a, a direction uh, where we should be going, but I think they kind of lost their way uh, in the last couple of years, and uh, the the discussion has gone to okay, which small 
program can we fund like be it the transportation issue in rural area uh, be it another issue like um, food security by um, encouraging people to have uh, gardens but it's kind of patchwork mm. so i think that's that's what's missing in the province this bigger discussion do you have a vision for what that would look like or what that would entail? Oh. <laughs> you know? Because yes. that's part of the narrative that needs to break. Yeah. If New Brunswick is stuck in a pattern of behavior since the mid-80s yeah. and it can't seem to get past itself for how it always does things, talking mm -hmm. in general terms, then somewhere out there there's people who see a different way of doing things that would generate the potential for the results that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Do you have a version of that? No, <laughs> but uh, what needs to happen is kind of a, what was do, done like in the 80s or even before, kind of a, a white paper mm -hmm. on, okay, what is the situation of poverty in New Brunswick and really have a, 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 an overview mm -hmm and start a real consultation or a discussion province-wide on some of the changes that need to be done. And a white paper is, yes, the, solution, the, the description of what's the situation, mm. but also some idea of where uh, we should be going so to start a real conversation in mm. society and I think that's um, uh, what should be happening uh, now who is going to spearhead that uh, I think it has to come from <clears throat> the elected official mm. and that's uh, usually there, there was one in the 80s a white paper on on uh, the whole issue of social development, the same thing that with Louis Robichaud on the equal, mm -hmm. uh, equal opportunity, that kind of idea or the kind of uh, reflection, but translated into discussion and translated into action. Where, where do we want to go after uh, all this, this discussion? Yeah. Because I think that's it's there's there's discussion happening at different level but it's not together yeah it's not integrated yet yeah. the um that makes me think of doing a great gathering at a provincial scale an open space forum kind of discussion where all of the people who represent a piece in the puzzle yeah finally have a time and a format and a process that would allow them to explore further where the real solutions are because it's between them where the solution is. Yeah. Well, it, you <clears throat> see, the, when the poverty reduction plan was put in place, this is what happened. Like for about a year, there was consultation all through the province. The only thing at, at the end, kind of the discussion was too narrow because they wanted to uh, come to kind of an agreement that the political party would agree on and the the, the four kind of pillars, which is government, uh, private industry, community organization, and people living in poverty. Yeah. So the I think the last uh, meeting that happened in St. John where the poverty uh, reduction plan was put in place was a little bit rush and um, uh, but I think the process that happened a year before was uh, okay. Like at the common front, we criticized it, uh, but we were involved in the in some of the discussion. But we criticized the end result. Um, and what we see now is uh, the the uh, the corporation being kind of. Uh, getting away from kind of the, the the principle at the beginning, but I think that has to happen again, but in a probably uh, broader scale and more kind of in-depth discussion. Do you feel sometimes mm, the desire for results or outcomes or goals gets in the way of actually getting to the goal? I'm thinking because, you know, the poverty reduction strategy is now in the phase seven or eight years later trying to measure outcomes to justify yeah. the spending the money. Yeah. It might be that 
you're going too soon. It might take 20 or 25 years to see the outcomes that you're looking for, a cohort. And it might be you will feel the outcome more than you will be able to measure the outcome. If that makes sense. Because a community that is well will know that it is well. And then the measurables will start to appear or that something has shifted rather than, oh, we haven't hit our target yet. It's like a sales target or poverty is so complex because we treat it like an end in itself. And it's a a mix of all of the pieces coming together. So I'm wondering if there's some play in there for approaching it in a different way and that we interrupted the process part way by looking for outcomes already to justify the spending. Partly, but the spending on the uh, poverty re- reduction plan is not big. I think the budget for the Crown Corporation is $2 million a year. It's really not a big budget. But um, for me, there, there has to be, uh, it's, I think, poverty, there has to be two parts to it at least. One, you have to measure the result in a sense of are people living in poverty getting more revenue? Because that's one part. Like if somebody is just making $537 a month, like they can't live with it. So one way of measuring is are are we increasing the amount that they're receiving so that they can have a kind of a have decent life and th- th- there's a bar which is the market measure market basket measure which is kind of the poverty line so there's there has to be a way of measuring what we uh, do to reduce poverty on one side the other side that's less measurable is the, all the issue of inclusion how do we include in society people that are that don't, that are living in poverty but don't have any power uh, don't have any say in the decision uh, and are really left out and that's what most people that are living in poverty are feeling and that's the reality also it's a segment of the population that's kind of just push on the side and that's left out of the decision and they just uh, kind of uh, are the end and anything that's decided they're the end product in a sense so that part is more difficult to measure but uh, there has to be a uh, there has to be a lot of more work to to do with kind of in- integrating making them part of society and uh, I, we don't have the solution like at the conference we we talked about this for a number of years we don't have any solution but there has to be uh, more reaching out and the reality also that we forget is for people especially that are on social assistance i would say at least a minimum of 80 percent are not employable like 30 percent are children like uh, below 17 uh, years old so uh, the the other um, uh, another big segment are people that are uh, con- uh, not considered but are, are disabled recognized disabled and another big segment of people that are on social assistance have real barrier to employment so how do we help them to have a decent living for themselves but especially for their kids because their kids are the the next generation yes so that they when they go to school they have the same chance as the rest of the uh, of citizen so it's it it's uh, for us it's always these two sides that has to be worked but you can't ask people to be part of society if they go to bed hungry and if they always have to go to the food bank uh, and always are in a, a situation that's a personal situation a family situation that's really difficult to live and that's what's happening right now and that's what's really difficult to uh, to accept as an organization as us but also i think as as a, as a society mm-hmm. do you have an example 
to personalize it without using people's names, but I'm, I'm sure it crosses your path a lot. And, <clears throat> and so it'd be nice to pull the curtain back a little bit so the viewers can know he, lots of stats. That's great. Um, yeah. But the human side of it, there must be some people you know that are in this situation. Yeah. Well, we just started, uh, we did the 16 interview with people that are living in poverty, and we started to put them on our Facebook page and on our website. And this, this, the reality of, of some of these people, uh, and I'll give you an example, somebody that's working in the southeast of New Brunswick that's um, uh, been on social assistance for a uh, quite a while that's making 537 a month so that person lives in a room he doesn't have like he he bought himself a small hot plate to be able to make toast the rest of the time like he goes to the soup kitchen uh, he barely survives he has like personal problems that stop him from working so that's his reality he doesn't have, of course, a car or whatever, so he either walks or rides his bicycle, which is difficult in the winter time. So his world is really limited, and his participation in society is really limited. Other uh, person that has um, uh, had had an accident, so was able to work for a number of years, but at one time couldn't keep working. So that same person, a single person, now he's older, but he's living on 537. Again, like he's able to have a small apartment, but the, the reality is their world is limited. Same, same thing for uh, people that has um, a problem that had uh, had a problem with uh, uh, the police that has a, a criminal record. So their uh, chance of having certain kind of job is limited. So they get some small job and partly on social assistance. So these are and, uh, and what we saw also in quite a number of the interview we, we did, uh, quite a number of people have um, help problem and that's why they end up on social assistance uh, the others have like family problem so that's the reality of people living on social assistance and some are them some of them are, are working also but not making enough so and that's part of what we're trying to do with these interview and um, uh, and I think that people don't understand the reality of quite a number of individuals and families. What is the reality that they, that they are living? And, uh, and quite a number of us probably we don't want to know either. <laughs> it's simpler, uh, be it politician, be it uh, individual, be it the, uh, the decision makers in society. Is what we don't know or we, what we don't see it's easy to forget. Yeah, that's why I asked earlier about opening our hearts a bit, yeah. because once we feel that connection, yeah. there's potential for change yeah. there. Yeah, and we see it, like we saw it, it comes out in crisis, like we saw it in the, uh, uh, when the river here went the up, flood, yeah. we, we saw it in uh, last winter in the Acadian Peninsula and also all around the coast with the, uh, uh, I storm. I storm. Uh, all of a sudden, people discovered. Yeah, uh, my neighbor to uh, to house down is living in poverty. I didn't know. So, uh, but it shouldn't be just in period of crisis <laughs> that all of a sudden we open our eyes. Mm. The, and but we open our eyes for a number of months and then we kind of close again yep. and and uh, and i guess the way to solve that it has to be translated in policies that are st and policy and then in program that will help people yeah and it that's a great point because it's not a project no it, it's no. it's systemic yeah and so that requires a whole behavior shift on the part of an awful lot of people yeah and a perception shift too. In, in that spirit, um, past guest on the show was Carlos Gomez. 
When Carlos was talking about his early career in the 70s, he was in charge of a project on behalf of uh, the Trudeau government, and uh, Mark Lalonde was the finance minister, I believe, on the guaranteed annual income. Yeah. And it was used in northern New Brunswick as one of the pilot areas. And Carlos's offering was that it was a great success. And then it disappeared <laughs> because of political pressures and business pressures. Does that ever come up in your work that um, some of this could be resolved with an awareness of a, a guaranteed annual income for some people that then in turn makes them more part of a community because they have that revenue limit that you speak to? Um, media will often talk about the $15 an hour minimum wage. Some people will talk about a fair wage. Um, that gets into sliding scales. You lose a certain amount of audience when it gets too complicated. Um, but somewhere in there, there are the elements to the answer. Do you want to explore the notion of an annual yeah. guaranteed income? Yeah, we, uh, oh, six, seven years ago, we had... Um, uh, we brought somebody uh, from Quebec uh, to discuss that issue. Uh, last year, we, with other organization, had a, a conference on it. The, but we, as an organization, we didn't take any position. But it, in a sense, we have a guaranteed annual income for people live, uh, that are on social assistance, in a sense. In a sense. Uh, but but there's, the, yeah, there's a series the, of penalties yeah. and oh, yeah. obstacles. Uh, yeah. And a lot of uh, policies that are really restrictive. So uh, one, there's a couple of questions regarding the guaranteed annual income that we have as an organization. The first of, uh, of the issue is uh, who would be covered? So would it be everybody? Would it be just a certain amount of, uh, depending on the revenue you have? That's the first thing. Second thing, what would be the amount? So uh, what's being uh, pushed around is about $20,000. Uh, but would it be for everybody, like in a sense, even children, or is it just for adult? And on the other, uh, so that's the second question. Third question is, if we put the guaranteed annual income, what are we taking out? What are we losing? Because one of the argument that uh, uh, some business are agreeing with the guaranteed annual income because the argument is it's going to cost less to government because you're going to be able to reduce some program. So the question is, if we're doing that, which program are we going to reduce? And the, the, uh, some of the argument that I read also is, if we're giving $20,000 to an individual, well, that person then could buy the program that he needs, like be it a, a program, a, a, a health insurance or something else. Mm -hmm. So that's what's not discussed enough when we're talking about guaranteed annual income. And it's, it's being pushed as kind of the, the solution, but there's quite a number of um, kind of studies that are coming up. And I read one by the Canadian Center of Policy Alternative where they look at uh, what w different impact it would have on different segments of the population and uh, what kind of kind of program would kind of disappear. So I think there's need to be a lot more discussion on it on one part. The other part is uh, what would be the overall cost? Like if it's a program that applies to everybody, I think the cost would be enormous unless you cut a lot of these uh, public programs that are up there. Mm. So uh, it's it's one of the avenue, but before it comes into play or in place, if ever we do it, uh, we need to keep pushing for increasing what we have right now, be it the minimum wage. Like for us, we're pushing for $15 an hour mm. uh, increase in um, rate for people on social assistance because they're they're not even at the poverty line. Uh, so, and 
changes to policies, especially for people on social assistance, because a lot of these policies are restrictive. So when we're looking at kind of a more global solution, I think we need to keep pushing for changes right now to help this, the families, the individual that are living right now. So as we talk about a guaranteed annual income, I'm wondering if uh, another piece of the narrative that I, I want to put them together mm -hmm. is the business community is forever able to secure money from governments on the promise of jobs. Yeah. And we're going to go through this again with another election cycle that's already started. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I've often wondered if we added up, it's just generalization, but if we added up all the money that goes to business for the sake of creating jobs, and we added up the money that goes towards poverty reduction and all of the needs around literacy and housing and food security. If we transferred some of that wealth over here, would it create the talent base needed or the resources needed or the quality of life needed to then come back and help support economic growth? Because you've talked about the segment of the population being isolated or can't get access to or has too many barriers to get through it. And you'll have business communities saying, I need more breaks from the government in order to be competitive. And there's no talent pool here for workers. I have to bring in foreign workers to do it. It seems like we have all the pieces. We just don't put them together a, a certain way. So has the Common Front ever said, well, look, you gave business all this money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why don't you give some of it over here and, and see a real change in our community? Yeah, we... Not meant Wait, as a confrontation either. No. It's meant as a yeah. shift. Yeah, um, I not well. First of all, we would need to know exactly how much money goes to business. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the premier some, a couple of years ago so, he gave himself a billion dollar slush fund, right, for creating mm -hmm. business. We're now starting to see some of that roll out. Yeah. For a five or seven year window, I tracked. You know, it was about five hundred million during yeah. a one election cycle was going towards business development. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's quite a number of um, uh, an amount of money that goes to business and bis well, business development in in one sense, and we've seen it in the last six months. Uh, it's it's amazing how much money all of a sudden we have. The the if we were transferring it to poverty reduction, probably well, it would certainly make a difference. Um, it's. To what extent? Uh, well, it would make yeah. It, people would have a lot more money in their pocket, first of all, so they would be able to just the like on the business side consume more because uh, they would be buying stuff like locally. Uh, they're not going to put that money in a in a saving account or go on vacation. They can they wouldn't be uh, able to f afford it. Uh, but it's it's. It's not clear, I guess, how how much change it would it would uh, would happen. What we need is, yeah, more help, more money in a sense. But we need to have a shift also in mentality, and that's why we're been pushing for a while. Uh, for a provincial campaign against prejudice for people living in poverty, because. I think it's going to be difficult for any government to really um, attack poverty in a meaningful way if there's resistance from the general public, and there is. Uh, there's, there would, and there's going to be more if we were putting more money and more effort to reduce poverty. So uh, that's why there has to be. Uh, concerted effort on uh, addressing the prejudice where we have. We do it on different issues. We're trying to do it now on immigration, on racism. But it has to be done also on the uh, whole issue of how do we look at poverty, how do we see people that are living in poverty. And that our our vision of it, if it doesn't change, I don't think there's going to be a real change in their situation. That That's an amazing point. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the YouTube clip that whistles through Facebook sometimes? It's about uh, 
poor people reading tweets about poverty. So they'll hand a person a tablet, you know, or an iPad, and they'll read tweets. And, okay. and they're reading it about what somebody said about them. Okay. And it's profoundly hurtful, mm -hmm. which is the point of the clip. Because yeah. it's real time. Someone's got another camera. They hand it to the person. They're on the street. They're saying that about me. Like, I've got a child, and I lost my job, and now mm -hmm. I'm stuck here. It's, yeah. It... it it points directly to what you talk about, that need for the attitude shift. Yeah. Yeah, and also there's another uh, uh, picture of uh, when we're talking about equality. Uh, so you have three people, uh, like two adults and one child, and there there's a, a, a barrier or a fence. And, uh, well, the child can't look at what's happening on the other side of the fence. But if you put some like boxes that that person can go and look so then you have equality so uh, it's the same thing uh, as poverty we want people that are living in poverty to go for a job but there's real um, concrete uh, stuff that they don't have be it education training uh, whatever mm -hmm. and it's how do you and these are concrete barriers so how do you uh, overcome this barrier and it's, sometimes it's not simple the one of the solutions for us is really to put the emphasis on trying to get at this barrier when people are young in a sense uh, either in school or in the, in the young families mm. uh, so uh, even for social assistance I think the one of the aspect that's missing from the department here is kind of targeting the young segment of citizens that are on social assistance and putting more uh, help more emphasis on uh, their training on trying to to bring their level so that they can have access to a job. Yeah, it's striking with schools, for example, where everyone is in the school, so you kind of have the whole community yeah. in that school, and you know a certain percentage of them won't have access to internet at home. They won't have eaten when they came to school. No. Like we we know the story. So they're. They're not at that level box looking over the fence yeah. position right from the start. And then that's how poverty cycles repeat themselves because that child, by the time they're 18, what are their opportunities? Yeah, yeah. I think partly the, the other part is just people like any of us, something happens in our life. Like, uh, and through the interview, that's what we uh, saw. Somebody has an accident and can't work anymore. Well, the only place they can go is on welfare, on social assistance. Yeah. So somebody that uh, is uh, in a relationship and the relationship stop, and uh, and it happens more for women because sometimes they they were not working or working at a small job. So. The other part is you, you have cancer or you have a heart attack and you don't have uh, in, in your job, you're not unionized, let's say, you don't have a, a sick leave. So what do you do? You have to leave your job. And where do you go? You, you go on, on a social, on a EI for a while, but after that, you're stuck on social assistance. And if your cancer is uh, is still a, it doesn't help, it doesn't put you back to, to you can't go back to work yeah. well you, so there's there's real uh, concrete situation that happens mm. and you're if you don't have these uh, help like the social help or the you didn't have a job that was paying you uh, well that you could have put money aside well you're, you're yeah. caught circumstances so, of poverty yeah. <clears throat> to play into the shadow side of this a bit or the darker side of this the flip side of what you've just presented us for the past while is a culture or prejudice or a vision of well if they would just pull themselves mm -hmm. up yeah. and go get, 
I have no idea where that phrase ever came from in the first place. I'm sure there's three generations now that don't even know what bootstraps are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But they sure feel it when yeah. someone talks that way yeah. and when a political leader talks that way, whether it's municipal or provincial or federal. And how do we get at that heart or that dark heart that thinks that all it takes is just to pull yourself up by because something's missing and empathy isn't going to do it. Um, you know, you can put them into an empathy exercise, which try it for 24 hours, you know, or there was a the program with the eating, you know, there was a, a strategy three, four years ago, maybe longer with um, a certain number of people, high profile signed up to eat off of a food bank menu oh, yeah. for a week. Yeah. Uh, empathy exercise yeah. trying to develop awareness. And still, it, it's consistent if they would just pull themselves up and go get a job. Thoughts about breaking that? Because that's a, that's a big one, and I wanted to go right at that. Hmm. How do we help those people not talk that way anymore, or not perceive it that way anymore? Well, because <laughs> <laughs> that's where we have yeah. to go, right? Yeah. yeah. Right at those people. Yeah, yeah. and it, it, I think it comes from like our vision of uh, kind of a, a perhaps male vision of society also mm. that um, uh, anybody can make it. And it's the, the vision also of capitalism is the vision of mm. the, the new world, uh, mm. Canada and the United States, that you were an immigrant, you could come here and just by your bootstrap, by working, mm. you could make it, you could be a millionaire. Yeah. With, and forgetting that there's thousands and hundreds of thousands that came here, didn't make a millionaire that yeah. died in poverty. Yeah. Uh, or that work all their life a small job, but this this uh, notion that everybody can make it, I think that's kind of one of the core of capitalism. That uh, is, if you're really working at it, you can be better, with without taking into account the structural. Uh, uh, the the structure of our economy, but also the the kind of society that we have, which is in in which has classes, yeah. and yes, uh, you can be uh, a person that uh, was living in poverty, your parents, or you had a small job and you went up in the world, but the majority are not like that. Just, but we always, it's the, the, the idea of the hero uh, that like be the Irving or the McCain or that they started small and they were able to, to build an empire. Mm -hmm. And this mentality is there in our society. Mm -hmm. And it's there even in sport, it's there in but the mentality of competition and i guess to how to change that is quite would be quite a social shift <laughs> and uh, i don't think it's it's, it's going to happen <laughs> rapidly yeah. but but it's interesting to surface it though um yeah. in some ways especially in english canada there's a huge influence of american culture on yeah. canadian values yeah. so that um pioneering spirit yeah. was very different in canada as i was taught it in my canadian history compared to the american version um, Canada is peace, order, and good government. Mm -hmm. That's our auspices. American is, you know, individual rights and freedoms. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe somewhere going back to being Canadian and that no one got there alone. Everyone in some form was responsible for someone else's success because it's all interconnected. Maybe remembering that spirit of community again will uh, help bridge some of that conversation. Perhaps it's partly also... Uh, I think partly when we shift from mainly a country that was mainly rural, where people need to help themselves a lot more, mm. to a, a country that's more urban, where people know each other less, mm. it's more individual, and there's probably more competition also. But it's it's... It's a mindset. It's a, it's it's more than a mindset. I think it's ingrained in the capitalist system, 
and that's what we're in right now. And mm. it's it's difficult. That's certainly difficult to to um, to change. But if we want as a society to evolve, I think we should be uh, evolving towards a more um, a society that take more compassionate society. That's for sure. Yeah, there's lots of examples around the world where they have found a balance between economy, government, and taking care of all their citizens. Um, we have about 10, 12 minutes left. Uh, I would like to slide into the election that's yeah. coming in the fall. We're recording this in the uh, end of June. Um, what would be your wish list for candidates and political parties for the coming election? Because Common Front is very good at letting people know and communicating. Mm -hmm. um, here are some potential solutions, draft policies, directions we could go. Um, mm -hmm. The window for the narrative is now, before. Yeah. Um, so first question would be, do you think New Brunswick can get past its lockstep with the two-party system? Because the common narrative right now is there's no difference between yeah. the two parties. Yeah. So are we ready yet for a shift, do you think? Uh, <laughs> let's hope so. <laughs> the, it's, uh, are citizens ready for a shift? Probably. The reality is that the way our electoral system is organized is difficult because um, uh, the it first of all it takes a lot of money to elect somebody. So the two the two political party, liberal and conservative, are the one that has really the money. Uh, secondly, the the way the uh, the our electoral system is working is there just one that can win uh, uh, that can win a, a riding and uh, uh, this there hasn't been a real shift in mentality i think in the public yet that we can work with uh, government that are not majority government and that's why like certainly like common front and a lot of uh, activists have been pushing for uh, proportional representation change our way of electing our uh, uh, our M MLAs or MPs so I think that's one part that um, would really need to happen to have a real shift in the way people are are voting on the other part for this election I think people are uh, genuine genuinely looking at the other political party and that could make a difference because they've seen in uh, in other province uh, BC and they got the NDP minor minority uh, government with the green uh, you saw in the NPI two green or three green uh, uh, ML MLE so and other places so there's I think a realization that there's other options hmm. uh, now how that's going to be translated in real vote that's going to be interesting and the other part also is are the young people going to go out and vote and because we know that they're not voting a lot yeah. on one side and the other side is people that are living in poverty are not voting enough we tried in the last election we had a campaign uh, trying to get uh, people that are living in poverty to go out and vote, the other organization tried it also. There hasn't been too many, too much success in it, and it's it's too bad. But that's the reality. Hmm. The um, in doing some research for this interview and for the election to come, um, the last election had 198,000 New Brunswickers did not vote. Yeah. And earlier you had spoken to the, here's the percentage of people yeah. in New Brunswick living in poverty, and it comes pretty close. Yeah. As well, when looking at some demographics for the province, there's roughly 82,000 New Brunswickers between 18 or 19 and 30. Um, if they would go out and vote, um, that would shift uh, an awful lot. Not only your dem democratic engagement with the process and paying a little bit of attention, but the impact it would have on uh, how the two existing political parties or dominant ones count on those people not voting yeah. um, because they know their memberships and they know within three or four percent um, what a potential turnout would be mm -hmm. or result would be in a particular riding. 
So those people could really skew the numbers. And in turn, that would shift the power back to people because in general terms, it's felt this is who you elect, but here's who's really making the decisions. Yeah. And so you can't get at those people behind the scenes. But if you change the conversation in the legislature by having all five colors in there, for example, um, then maybe something would shift on poverty reduction strategies or a different sort of economy starts to emerge. Does the Common Front have specific um, policy that it wants to see yeah. um, from no matter who's elected? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had two kind of campaign in the world for a number of years a number of months now and we met all the political party on, on these we met uh, also a number of ministers and one is the whole issue of uh, low-income workers so well, certainly increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour mm. but also change the uh, employment standard like people that are uh, not unionized and that's the majority of, of workers uh, they just have the employment standard as protection in the workplace and if you're just with the minimum standard you don't have e e any um, sick leave that are paid so if you're sick you have to take time off there's a number of changes that has to happen to uh, the, min the employment standard so that the workplace is a lot more uh, friendly in a sense to workers and also uh, will give them a better uh, life and so this, uh, we have a number of changes that we're proposing on, on one side for low-income workers. The other one is certainly on social assistance. So we look at what they're receiving regarding the money. And uh, what we're proposing is that there's certainly be an increase. And we're, we're saying there has to be a, a bar, which is the... the uh, the poverty line which is the market basket measure so and we're saying the government should plan for the next 10 year to make increase in each year in the basic rate so they attain this bar uh, this uh, minimum uh, standard which is the, the the kind of poverty poverty line but also certainly to change some of the policies so and this uh, we have uh, like a series about 10 policy that we're looking for change we present that we presented that to all the political party and certainly to uh, do a, a provincial campaign on prejudice so we we have put together these uh, documents we met like i said all the political party and we said to them look if you're serious in wanting to reduce poverty these are concrete uh, proposal that if put in place would make a difference now are you ready to put it in your electoral platform uh, and we'll see we did the same exercise four years ago in the last election and some of the proposal were put in the platform uh, some were implemented but this year we went kind of further because we we put in front of them a lot more uh proposal but also like the argument why we need these change so we'll see and it's we told them like we're going to evaluate your platform before the election what you put in it or what you haven't put in it and we're going to let the public know and uh, through our membership, through all the the ways we can we can to make uh, the public aware of uh, if you're serious in wanting to help workers, low income workers, and people that are on social assistance. So we'll see. Like the it's like anything else. The reception was good, but it's different from saying, "Yeah, we understand what you're saying," and putting it in action and putting it in concrete uh, uh, part of their program. So we'll, we'll see. But it's going to be interesting to see the, I hope, the difference 
in different political party which and will give us also and the public an idea of where uh, their uh, through their platform where they want to bring our society in the, the next four year thank you for this okay aussi merci beaucoup pour faire l'interview en anglais oh no problem <laughs> And thank you for watching. If you want to find out more information about the Common Front for Social Justice, look up frontnb.ca and all of their comments, I'm sure, and the documents that Jean-Claude was just talking about would be found there, as well as their Facebook page. If you like the work we do here on The Dennis Report, please consider supporting the show and sharing it with your friends and starting a conversation. Be good, have fun, love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon.